guys, welcome to session three of uh, uh, TNL Outreach, Travel and Leisure India South Asia's TNL Outreach, which is a series of webinars on travel, tourism, and hospitality. Um, this time we've got these amazing industry veterans. Uh, <clears throat> Don't forget to catch the June issue of uh, the magazine, which will have all the travel trends for 20 and 21 decoded through our magazine's series of ongoing webinars. Okay, so today we've got a really interesting discussion lined up, guys, with an amazing uh, with an amazing lineup of people. Uh, TNL Salutes will be discussing the way forward for luxury outbound travel and what travelers can expect from the new face of hospitality. Uh, my name is Rian George. I'm a regular contributor with Travel and Leisure. So I'm a luxury journalist and blogger based in India and Sri Lanka. We've had an overwhelming response to this session and uh, yep so i'm going to start actually um with this and uh, guys thank you so much i'm going to start by saying thank you so much for your time and for joining us i'm going to throw open this question uh, to uh, to saurabh um guys i'm going to introduce saurabh who is the ex executive vice president of um preferred hotels and resorts south and southeast asia saurabh you correct me if i'm wrong middle east asia australasia and he steers the development of and the business of uh, preferred hotels in the region with offices in dubai singapore new delhi cape town and singapore and you joined the company as early as 2008 and of course um what you have been doing lately in the hospitality industry has been consider consolidating strategic partnerships with the Leela Palaces, Hotels and Resorts, ITC Hotels, Palazzo Versace, Dubai, Paramount Hotels and Resorts, among others. So the first question is to you, Saurabh. What are the key criteria that travelers will look for when they are making their travel plans post-coronavirus, in your opinion? Great. Thanks very much, Rion, for setting up the panel to you and to Travel and Leisure. It is uh, an exciting opportunity to share the stage with... Uh, uh, Giovanni, Michael, and uh, uh, Thomas as my fellow speakers in here. So appreciate the opportunity and, and thank you for soliciting the views. So uh, getting right to it, I think, uh, Rian, in my uh, humble opinion, uh, with, with what, I'm, what I'm experiencing around, travel has already reached a spot of evolution in many people's lives where it is considered possibly the best form of education, uh, inspiration for many of us, and even therapeutic. Uh, just you know, sharing some of my personal experience in there. So recovery is going to be, in my in my view, a little bit rapid. Now, on the other side, what would the travelers seek? Uh, to simplify this, uh, very much so, is clarity. I think where the uh, collaboration between the following parties would need to come together very quickly to extend the clarity to the travelers is the countries and the tourism destination boards, the airlines, the hotels, the retail segment, they all need to come together and establish and broadcast some very, very clear and coordinated guidelines in terms of the quarantine laws, in terms of safekeeping and travel norms, hotel policies, the do's and don'ts. Currently, the only thing that could possibly retard or impair the euphoria and the excitement that is pent up, uh, and we must allow it to express fully, is by bringing out a clearly broadcasted response that lets the travelers believe and offers them the minimum level of comfort and confidence that they need to get out there. So okay. um, to sum up, it's the clarity that we need to extend, that we owe to the travelers. So I mean, what you're talking about is a strong communication that needs to come out from brands as well. Okay, um, so I'm going to actually pass on this question to Michael Go, who's the president of Dream Cruises and the head of international cruise getting Cru uh, international sales at Genting Cruise Lines based in Singapore. Um, Michael, you first joined Genting Cruise Lines in 2000 and uh, you were appointed as president of Dream Cruises in, uh, and head of international sales in July 2019. You have about 30 years of uh, industry experience. What can you tell us? Because obviously the cruise line industry has been uh, gravely affected. Um, can you 
take on from Saurabh's point about clear communication in terms of um, what these expectations are from travelers? When the post-COVID, the travelers, um, I think in terms of safety, uh, I think they were really very concerned. So it is very important uh, for us actually to educate uh, the consumer what are the preventive measures and what are the various things that they have to do to provide them and their family a safe journey. So uh, this is important uh, for them to know before they mix uh, that kind of traveling. We also think that the travelers will opt for a shorter holiday uh, between five days or so. And also their, their, their choice of destination will be started off with Asia before going further away. Okay. So that, that we think that will be kind of like post-convict kind of a, a, a travel scenario. Okay. So that's a very interesting point. I'm going to actually now move on to a Giovanni, Giovanni Vitterale. Um, Giovanni, who is the general manager of the Fullerton Hotels and Resorts, and once again, a hospitality industry veteran. Uh, Giovanni has helmed the Fullerton Hotels and Resorts in his position as a general manager. And this, under his leadership, the brand uh, encompasses the Fullerton Heritage Project in Singapore, which has really kind of become world famous. And of course, you have led the brand towards international expansion. Giovanni, what can you tell us? How is the industry prepping itself to handle, um, handle things post uh, the COVID travel bookings? And what kind of travelers are you expecting? Thank you for the kind introduction. The COVID-19 pandemic um, has definitely changed the consumer behavior. In the short term, there will be a lot more travelers opting for domestic trip and last minute bookings, but it depends on travel bans and the price fluctuation. Business travelers who have uh, to travel due to critical business needs uh, will also hop on the plane when travel bans are lifted. But the numbers will certainly fall because many of us have found a new way to work via, via video conference as we do now. And I foresee luxury travel to pick up faster than mass market travel too. Luxury travel has a, always been a trendsetter in the hospitality industry and uh, the exclusivity also allows for more protection against any exposure to the virus. Even now, my contacts ranging from business owners to C-suites have told me that they are starting to plan on where they want to holiday, where they want to go for holiday when the pandemic is over. Yeah. In the long term, when the situation is more stable, I certain, I'm certain that people will travel again. We are all social creatures that needs to connect uh, the world remains a wonderful place for, with these incredible sights, and everyone is talking about when, when, when. There's fascinating culture and, and this incredible experience that we had in the past it will happen again. Despite the present trying times, the spirit of travel and the joy of connecting with people and culture all over the world will be alive for, for many years to come, and uh, it will be over soon. I'm sure. Okay, thank you for that, Giovanni. And with that, I'd like to also introduce and bring in our fourth panelist, Thomas Gruntner, who is the Vice President of Sales and Marketing at JA Resorts and Hotels, has led the commercial function since 2017. And he joined in 2017 as the group's new VP of Sales and Marketing. Thomas, you have, of course, led the brand on a trans on an epic trans transformation, including a rebranding exercise and all new food and beverage portfolio and of course international expansion i'd like to hear your perspective from the middle east on this uh, what is how is the industry prepping itself to handle this post covid travel and what kind of travelers are you expecting thank you very much and and very pl pleased to be on the panel with, with such an expert of expertise and, and there have been some good points already and 
if I look back a little bit, when we, when we rewind, our, rewind ourselves back to March 15th, when the first big messages came across, and we have today, end of May, we've seen quite a transition of up and downs. And I think looking back the last two and a half and three months have impacted our business tremendously on a positive, but also on a negative side. I think on a positive side, it has actually forced us to relook on how we do business and how do we actually move forward into the future. I actually do see very positive into the future, considering if I look at the next three or four months, you're seeing in Europe some very positive movements on travel restrictions being removed. So um, there, there will be travel again. It might be slightly different. I agree to Giovanni that luxury will definitely have, have its edge here because of space and, and individuality. Mass tourism definitely will have some challenges around it based on space. But we also need to relook at ourselves. Do 800 room hotels or 1,000 room hotels still able to accommodate the requirements which we operate in today? Or are the smaller niche operators and, and more nimble approaches more feasible on, on what's moving forward? Um, so, so from my perspective, I, I see very positive that things will move on. The human being is, is a little bit of a, a very fast, forgettable person who, who, who looks at their points moving forward. And holiday has always been something where everybody is eager to, to continue with. And that is something which people don't like to be taken away. So vacation, travel, and that is where the industry, we, we depend 80% of our business on, are actually very positive on into the future. Okay, thank you very much, Thomas. So, which brings me to my next question about this whole lockdown. So, during the lockdown, each of your groups, the hotel group, cruise group, whatever you did during the lockdown to ease the current crisis and to prepare yourself for this whole post COVID tourism. So, I'd like each of you to talk about what your respective groups did during this period of confinement and lockdown to brace yourself for this post travel, starting uh, with you, Michael. Now there, for, for us, our, our, in Singapore too, our ships are used to house of, uh, migrant worker. So the, the team actually in, uh, had been quite busy in actually working with various industry, uh, ministry actually to, to kind of like to cater to the requirement. Now, this is really a, a great opportunity for us because from this actually uh, experience in handling the recovered COVID patient, it really gave us uh, a lot of new knowledge uh, into the future uh, uh, cruise operation, uh, I think, in a, to cater into the new norm. Now, of course, I think beside that, uh, the, the brand awareness is always got to be continued, whether it is going to be COVID or not. So at this point of time, uh, the team has been doing a lot of the uh, uh, Facebook, online, social media in uh, sharing the uh, various activity that, uh, that that we usually do on board the ship. Take example, uh, cooking demonstration, uh, introduce a live entertainer on board, uh, 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 exercise, done classes. It is important for us at this point of time to continue to keep the brand or uh, uh, awareness actually in the market. Okay. Now, besides that, uh, we've also been engaging a lot, uh, whether it's, this is the B2B business platform, we do a lot of webinar training uh, in terms of product update. Now, in terms of product update, uh, uh, it is a time for us also to review in the new norm what really the consumer want. I think in terms of itinerary, it is also important for us to educate the travel trade, our business partner, what kind of safety measure, what the sanitization programs that we do on board the ship, how safe is this going to be when it is this big, uh, post uh, COVID-19. So well, the team has been quite busy in many areas to keep the business, uh, to prepare when the business reopens. Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Michael. I'd like to, um, Take this question to Thomas, who'd give us a perspective from the Middle East. What has what has uh, JA been doing uh, during this whole lockdown period? 
Well, we've got uh, two properties on the Indian Ocean, so we utilize the opportunity with our Maldivian property to do some enhancements, which we were not able to do when you have guests on the island. So we had to do some beach repiling, et cetera, and, and, and modernization on a few constructional sites, which you had to get some heavy equipment on onto the island. And that was a good opportunity actually to get something done in the meantime when you have no physical guests available. Um, I think the biggest uh, focus for us was, as already Michael said, it's keeping the brand alive, doing activities where you do some, some small activities uh, and, and engaging your, your guests. But I think the biggest task which we did was internally relook at structures, processes, and actually relooking at how you actually do things. You know, I think we've come to a very comfortable environment over the last few years, continuing copying and pasting and living quite, quite comfortable in the way we do things. So we looked at check-in processes, check-out um, formalities, uh, housekeeping approaches. Um, and then one major focus was for, our, for us, for sure, technology components. Uh, why, where are we able to see, can we streamline activities far more convenient with IT equipment? And now you had the time to focus on it because you had no direct guest experience and guest contact. So. Uh, Therefore, we spent quite a bit of time to look at these processes over the last few weeks. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Uh, I'm going to throw the question to Saurabh now. You guys at, uh, at Preferred Hotels, what have you been doing sitting at the corporate office? How, has, have, how have you been preparing for this post-COVID phase? Great, thanks, Rian. A lot of good commentary has been brought in from a regional and industry perspective as well. So, you know, ours is a bit of a unique perspective because of course our business is global uh, we've got close to 800 hotel partners in over 85 countries so we have to embrace a global view and let me just break it down into three quarters please what 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 started in march with the pandemic coming through and expressing itself quarter one which is essentially april may june was really all about preservation and safekeeping of the health of our associates and our member hotels and people on board while minimizing cash burn, right? I wish there was a magic formula, but it was really, a, it, it was an existential threat. Uh, and we had to kind of, you know, curate a formula that did not exist before to minimize the cash. Moving forward, I think the months are June onwards till about uh, August, September. This is where I think we are all kind of thawing back. And, you know, the reality of kickstarting the economy, the travel engine is now setting upon us. So what have we done so far over the last three months is we have done the uh, obligation and responsibility across the domains of global sales, across corporate leisure and group sales, marketing, loyalty, technology, to technology, sorry, to trend watch, to trend watch very sharply from around the world and keep our ear to the ground and pass the information in almost and in real time to a partner hotel so, so they could basically watch the moving target. This has been a moving target. We thought we were gonna land at X. We actually landed at 10X in terms of the intensity of, of, of how bad the crisis has been. And now where we are, we are now that we have kind of started to put a box around what the demand recovery flow and uh, duration could potentially look like, we are training our eyes on essentially the last four months of the year for some kind of demand recovery at, at an acceptable percentage of uh, uh, travel coming back. So we carried out a quick survey, I'll, report, I'll take 30 seconds to report across about you know, uh, three and a half thousand of our most engaged I Prefer, which is our loyalty program, members around the world. So we went around with these very engaged set of buyers to just do a consumer speak sentiment survey. And 20% of them had already booked travel before December 2020. And another 54% told us that they are looking and are confident of traveling again within the year 2020. So that, that is about 75% of the total consumer speak group saying, hey, okay, mm -hmm. we will travel again within okay. this year. Okay. That's what we've been busy with. Okay, thank you. Uh, Giovanni, I wanted to ask you, uh, talking about this whole demand recovery and trend watching, have you, is this something that you guys have been doing as well during the whole lockdown, watching out for trends in the hospitality as well as kind of uh, tracking the demand recovery? Oh, yes. Um, in fact, you know, um, all my 30 years here in Asia, I went through many of these ups and downs. Uh, 
And we also believe that um, uh, uh, always uh, opportunity, you know, there is always an opportunity in every crisis. And that's why we also, what everybody has just mentioned, we took the opportunity to reinvent our business and examine various areas to improve our products and offering during the, the lockdown period. First, uh, we started during uh, uh, this time offering food delivery, takeaways, options uh, for our regular guests at our hotels and both hotels. And uh, guests really loved it to have their favorite dishes in the comfort of their home. Mm. We are also focusing on completing our brand new Fullerton experiences. These include creative packaging with interesting local activities like, for example, uh, watercolor painting along the Singapore River right behind us here, yeah. as well as uh, moving forwards our ongoing renovation. As you know, we almost completed all our, our room renovation and suites. Thirdly, we uh, took uh, full advantage of the training opportunities that were offered through here in Singapore, through various uh, Singapore ministries, from the front of the house to the back of the house. Our staff had a great opportunity to undergo enhanced training to holiday skills further and in preparation for our reopening, which uh, we, we thought were, was coming soon, next week, but uh, now has been postponed. Okay, thank you very much, Giovanni. So I'm going to go uh, back to Thomas. Um, this is a question that's coming in from a lot of our readers as well. So when do you think, in your opinion, that international travel will start picking up steam? Do you have an estimation? And um, what do you think are going to be the key markets for the time to come? I think that's the one million dollar question for everyone. That's the one million dollar question. Literally. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Business is going to kick back. Yeah. Um, so, so definitely what we see is I think governments are definitely going to ease travel domestically, like what we see in, in the UAE at the moment. We are, we are able to see that beach facilities have been able to open. We're still restricted with pool, gyms, and, and other facilities. So we're seeing slowly a, a domestic demand for those who want to get out but we also see still quite a few people being hesitant actually aren't willing to travel since they are still a little bit worried about what's going to happen um, if we then able to move into a more of a regional structure within the gcc i think that will be the second phase hopefully which we'll see by by latest by by august and it all depends very strongly on border restrictions i think if if we do have clarity on border departures and arrivals that will give us some more guidelines and clarity on when we can travel again. Okay. Uh, if you, for example, see in Europe, uh, the UK is currently trying to implement a quarantine for 14 days. Any other European state is actually trying to release that. So they're going a little bit against the trend. So it depends a lot on, are you in need to get into a 14 day quarantine, yes or no? And what is the arrival and departure process of guests boarding and arriving, what's the time frame? what tests needs to be done. I think if we are able to get some more information over the next few weeks over those gut from those governments, I think then we can hopefully predict that we're gonna get slowly seeing some business coming back in Q4 on what is booked, like what Saurabh already highlighted, that, that there is some good business already on the books. And I see slowly then business for 2021 to come into where people are a bit more cautious to say, let me wait a bit more and uh, I will then be feel more comfortable, perhaps also with the vaccine coming on board. So it, it, it's a bit staggered, but we are impacted by outside factors which are guided by, by government uh, directions. Okay. Thank you very much, Thomas and Giovanni. As you said, uh, you are, your opening is uh, once again delayed. Am I right? Correct. Right. Yes. So um, once again, that question to you, when do you think that you'd like you see the steam picking up and what, in your opinion, are going to be your key markets at your hotel? Singapore, um, as you may have heard, continues to be a great destination. There is a strong business demand and uh, uh, stopover opportunities. The real question is uh, when will international travel again be allowed into Singapore? and which country will come first. 
we hear in the local media that discussion are underway to create a green corridors between countries that are the similar point in the pandemic control journey. A few countries have already opened up for domestic travel, but it is still very early to make a prediction of international travel. One of the common pitfalls of forecasting is to provide too much detail or precision or to calculation based on a very broad assumptions. We know that major companies like uh, Sojourn or Andara companies that have access to online search data about airline flights are predicting Q1 2021 as a, a tipping point, but that could change quickly. If a yeah. reciprocal agreement were executed between Singapore and Australia, for example, that will uh, definitely change the face of travel soon. Okay. Thank you. Um, Michael, once again, another perspective from Singapore. When, when do you think you are likely to see those lovely ships back out uh, on the sea again? Uh, when we actually operate the ships are uh, Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, Taiwan, China. Now, we, the, the beauty of the cruising is we could actually go on a uh, cruise to nowhere or we actually call into the international destination. Hmm. Uh, in, uh, in our uh, uh, discussion with various government agencies, uh, we hope that, uh, I think for domestic cruising, we can resume our business like in August, and then for international, hopefully actually from October onward. Now cruising, beside being a home port, we're also talking about port of call. So it is also related to how soon the related port of call are being reopened, what is the local government policy, and as well as uh, what Giovanni mentions about the green corridor between the G to G uh, arrangement. So we hope that we'll be able to start our domestic cruising in August and then subsequently October for international. Okay. Okay, thank you, Michael. And I'm going to throw this question to Saurabh as well, who might be able to give us a larger market perspective. Uh, Saurabh, what, in your opinion, do you think will be the key markets uh, in the months to come? You know, it's, it's a very uh, um, destination market uh, specific question there, Rian. What we are seeing is, you know, I think Giovanni, Michael Thomas have made some very critical points in here. So let's take China for an example. When you've got such a humongous domestic demand engine, I think the answer is simpler and more obvious in terms of where your business reactivation is going to come out. So globally, when we look at the entire world, there are about five or six such big geo domains that we know where local, regional, local, where any, and any destination, any travel destination where a traveler can just pick up without the passport, go and travel, where you're driving or you're flying domestically, those markets are at a, what I would call a reactivation advantage. So this includes uh, places like China, places like India, places uh, like maybe within US, which are away from the you know, uh, heavily infected uh, zones and the travel bubble stroke green corridors being created, whether it's Australia, New Zealand, or it's going to be within Southeast Asia. So the way we are looking at it is uh, we, we, we study our hotels for where they are located and what their reactivation, specific reactivation strategy would look like. EU is another good example where within EU, travel is going to be facilitated earlier than yeah. um, travel is being allowed elsewhere, right? So it's going to be a really a question of where our hotels are related. And what we've had to do is pretty much park aside yesterday's marketing playbook. We have um, you know, invested the last two odd months in re-scripting a very localized reactivation of demand. So all our efforts, whether they're technology empowered, sales empowered, B2C marketing enabled through our loyalty, they're all trained towards localized domestic regeneration of demand. And I like this word that you've said that you've actually re-scripted your strategy entirely. Very much so. Very much so, because the the you know uh, the consumer behavior, the traveler buying behavior is going to be motivated by uh, we hope are is going to be motivated by very very different inspirations. The the weighing scale, the set of priority index that they used while booking airline, booking hotels, choosing destinations, 
uh, three months ago is not going to be the same set of criteria that they, they would use to evaluate and, and figure out their tomorrow's travel decisions. Okay, thank you very much, Saurabh. Uh, Giovanni, I'd like you to, uh, to uh, take on from that, talking about re-scripting a marketing strat strategy. What would you say that you guys at Fullerton have been doing to re-script things? Uh, we had to re-script uh, almost uh, every single area and one of our key focus was to examine all areas of our business to have a more focused business strategy. Travel in this new world will look very different, that's for sure, and we need to evolve our hotels business accordingly. Firstly, travel businesses should adopt operation. We have to redesign public, uh, public spaces and modify employee practices to protect guests and employees. For instance, in the Fulton Hotels, we are implementing new technology, including a digital concierge service that provides touchless solution to reduce any risk of uh, virus transmission. Yeah. Secondly, travel business must adopt and implement any the sanitation procedures to combat COVID-19 and restore travelers' confidence. This should be aligned with expert accredited hygiene protocols. One way we have done so in our hotels was to introduce hospital-grade equipment and new technology to clean our hotels. Recently, we produce handheld disinfectant spray machines which utilize electrostatic spray technology and the highest grade of disinfectants to decontaminate various touch points in our hotels. This is a tool recommended by the World Health Organization. And we are continuing to check and evolve in every single area on how we can make our guests confident and safe in the future. Thank you, Giovanni. How about you, Thomas, from, uh, from your market specific point of view? Is there something that you guys would like to highlight in terms of a rescripting or a rethinking process? I think we, we've been fortunate that, like I've said, we've had plenty of times to focus on, on some technology elements. Uh, we have rebuilt a B2B booking engine where agents in future can book directly in, in order to make rates available. We've also enhanced processes on pushing rates into the market far more seamless than, than an old traditional way. So we, we have focused quite a bit on, on the technology element on how we actually make rates and how we make us bookable to certain agents in, in Africa or even in Saudi Arabia. The fortunate situation is a lot of travel agents have been made full of, across Europe, which is our key source markets. So we've got webinars which we have ready and we're able to, to press the button as soon as we're able to get, get that back into, into people's mindset. We have been a bit cautious about being pro, too proactive. So we've got, as, as Giovanni and, and also you know, Michael said, we've got everything ready on how we, we are able to move things forward. And it's a bit of a moving target. We, we need to see how the, the, the market situation moves forward and then we're able to, to press the right buttons. Additionally to that, we've had some time to focus on our new brand in China, Big Bet by JA, which we're going to open in September in, in China. So that is definitely where we had some more time to focus on brand guidelines, technology setup, and launching a new brand in, in the current climate uh, yeah. uh, gave us enough time and spirit to, to spearhead that project. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, I'm moving on to my next question now regarding your employees. I, obviously, uh, everyone's been feeling this pinch. Um, Michael, what have you guys been doing to kind of keep up that morale of your employees and you know to boost that confidence levels that uh, uh, among your employees? During this time, uh, I've been. Uh, it is important for us that you to up the skill of the employee. Uh, and also when the post-COVID, uh, the way of doing business will also be different. So the cost structure is actually one of the key consideration. So this time we have also been doing a lot of cross-training uh, to kind of like to pass the knowledge of uh, uh, the staff be able to do multitask. That will also kind of like uh, enrich their knowledge. 
Now, in addition, we also been uh, sending the staff actually on onto certain training courses, uh, and within the company, also certain uh, design courses. I think in terms of upskill in uh, uh, service quality, uh, are constantly been 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 putting in. Importantly, is to get the employee continue to uh, engage. So uh, we do a lot of webinar uh, training into the B two B and B two C uh, ch uh, channel, and the staff are also very actively involved in that. So with that, they they are kind of like keeping themselves occupied and learning new knowledge at the same time. Okay. Thank you. Um, Giovanni, I'd like to ask you the same question. You obviously are very hands-on with uh, the operations and the staff. Uh, what have you been doing to kind of boost the morale of your team? Very important uh, subject, uh, uh, colleagues and team members. You know, despite being uh, physical apart, technology has allowed us to connect uh, with my team easily. I've been providing uh, regular updates through my LinkedIn page. I uh, did a webinar last, uh, uh, last Friday with uh, my entire team members. Uh, also through our Fullerton social media and the emails to ensure our guests also receive the latest updates from us regarding uh, our free, uh, flexible booking policy. Also interested content and tips on uh, wellness, travel, lifestyle culinary through our Fullerton newsletters as well. It's important nowadays that, um, again, uh, despite being physical apart, we need, uh, we must uh, stay connected. We have no okay. excuses. Thank you very much. Thomas, how about you? Uh, we, we've been very fortunate that, that we've got, uh, with the accommodation we have in Dubai, where we operate seven hotels, uh, we've been very actively engaged with the staff on movie nights, trainings, uh, keeping uh, processes up to scale. But more important was the moral of, of everybody because people were you know, distracted from their families. We gave them access to communication tools. Uh, we also supported some who really were desperate to, to leave home, which wasn't so easy on, on the current processes and flight capacities. So from, from that element, we've been a brand which has been in the UAE since 1982. So, so there's a long leverage of, of relationships, also with, with other companies where we join, uh, do joint activities together to keep everybody really motivated yes. and also preparing everybody back for the start date. In, in the Maldives, it's a bit of a different scenario because you're based on an island and in the majority of, of colleagues there are actually from neighboring uh, islands, so they were able to move freely back and forwards again. And on the Seychelles, we had similar setups since the majority of colleagues there are Seychellese or Maldives, uh, which were able then to reunite with their families in order to make sure that that was the key priority to give them actually yeah. access back home again. Okay. Thank you very much, Thomas. Um, my, my next question is to Saurabh. Saurabh, at the end of the day, now in the post uh, post covid time all we're looking for especially you as a marketer new policies new bookings new reservations so could you talk to us about some of the new policies um or the new offers or collaborations that you possibly might be putting together at preferred hotels to attract more bookings because you really want to attract those new bookings now with, with pleasure thanks Rian. So, you know, like I was talking about the new playbook, it's uh, fair to say that we've had to uh, delightfully bring forward sweeping changes. You know, when you are going through a normal course of business, it is uh, a little bit human tendency to be a slightly risk averse, right? You don't want to disrupt something which is, which is working fairly well. But in here, when the whole thing is broken, beaten, smoked out, there's nothing to lose. So it's a great opportunity to rebuild from scratch. So let me just pepper in some input, inputs segment-wise. Let's just take uh, sales, for instance. So on behest of our partner hotels, we generate demand from you know close to 750 corporate accounts. All the Fortune 500s are in there. We know corporate travel tomorrow is going to be highly differentiated. So the, the way the corporate contracting, the RFP process works, is going to go through a very, very different lens and a set of criteria. 
So we have spent time. Our sales team in the market that's responsible for corporate segment, they've been out talking to them, trying to understand what the policies of tomorrow would look like what the business reactivation curve towards the year end of early next year, 2021 RFP season would look like. Now, sales is also a lot about events. We participate in a lot of events around the world, whether they are uh, you know, industry events, uh, travel, corporate focus events, leisure events, et cetera. Now, the big question out there is, are events going to go virtual? So we are investing a lot of time in research with a dedicated task force studying the future of events. If they are going to go virtual, uh, we are obligated um, to, and, and responsible towards the hotels to bring forward that technology solution at the earliest in order to keep our member hotels connect to the bookers and the end consumer fraternity. Shifting gears on distribution technology, right? The road to recovery on pricing and demand uh, regeneration is critical. So the big thought that we are trying to uh, campaign and discuss with our hotels is deep discounting may just jumpstart your demand by about 10, 15% in the short run, but in medium term, it's gonna hurt. So we are propagating a value enrichment approach rather than deep discounting approach in order to keep, keep the price and the experience sanity intact. So that's a little bit about sales and marketing. Very importantly, Rian, in, in terms of how we are preparing and working with the hotels to prepare for tomorrow, you, you touched on partnerships. Now, partnerships is a, is, a, is a very, very big component of what we bring forward uh, to our member hotels. So there, our commitment and promise is about going out there and finding the right partner on the quality assurance, on the health and hygiene certification front that is enabled to accelerate our partner hotels communication to the end consumers and bookers to say, we are ready to welcome you back. We are a safe house. You, are, you can come in without any inhibition. So we have worked very hard and I'm excited to say that over the next uh, couple of weeks, we're going to be announcing this package. And some of the other components there include one component which we so far haven't touched is about sustainability and a bit of a fear. A lot of core travelers that we are talking to, especially in the leisure family, multi-gen tra uh, travel space is about, well, the pandemic we survived, but all the chemicals that the airlines and you know all the establishments are going to deploy on the surfaces, are they gonna kill us? So it's a yeah. very big question out there to have sustainable, uh, environmentally uh, friendly access to cleaning supplies. Giovanni touched briefly on that electrostatic spray, but you know we are taking it a little bit upon ourselves to go out and find these forward thinking solutions that allow us to restart in the right manner. Yeah. Um, Michael, would you like to also highlight uh, something about uh, the new offers or collaborations or policies that you guys are putting into place to attract more, bu more bookings? Partnership is one of the partnership is one of the key. Uh, as take example, Singapore as an example, say 30% of our business are domestic, 70% of our business are international. So partnerships with airlines, partnership with hotel in Singapore are the key. This is really a good time uh, for us actually trying to relook at the business model and get these partnerships expanded and uh, to, to, to offer its kind of value. The other thing is the consumer are also uh, cautious about cancellation policy. So what we have come out is cruise as wish. So this allow the consumer to cancel 48 hours before the sailing date. And then we can actually give them a cruise credit and they could cruise, uh, cruise further to next year. So rebuild the con consumer conf confidence this is really important. And of course, the cost model is something that is going to be looked into. Now, when the cruise ships are taking less passenger with lower occupancy, it is not possible for us to kind of like give deep discount, but experiential will be the key to drive the business. So that will be the approach that will be moving, uh, moving forward. 
moving forward. Okay, and finally, I'd like to throw that question to Gio Giovanni as well. In the meanwhile, I'd like to also tell the audience that if you if you have any questions for our panelists, please do leave them in the chat, and I'll try to take uh, as many questions as possible. Giovanni, I'd let you continue, please. I totally agree on the pricing and strategy. Uh, it lower the pricing, it doesn't uh, help long term or mid term. Uh, we are very fortunate that both our hotels in Singapore and Sydney are unique and offer compelling experiences. As Michael also mentioned, experiences that help differentiate them from the international affiliated hotels. We believe that these factors, in addition to the commitment of an enhanced level of safety and hygiene, will be appreciated by our current and future guests. Those guests will understand the value that we represent. And this is uh, something that uh, is in our DNA and we'll continue to do so. Okay. Thank you very much for your perspective, Giovanni. Uh, guys, that's pretty much it from my questions. Uh, I'm actually going to start asking you some of the questions that have come in and we've got some really interesting ones. The first one is actually for Thomas. Um, Thomas, uh, Anuj is actually asking if there are any special offers or packages or anything that you're doing marketing specific for the India traveler, for the India market. That's a very relevant question. Well, I think there's always uh, a, an opportunity to, to create offers based on the requirement and the needs. Like, for example, in our property in the Seychelles, we actually do a buyout for, for the entire island for 10 villas. So I think we're doing unique setups where we actually create something which is unique and different. Um, just discounting a normal price of an existing accommodation stay, we would not move into to focus. It is more about creating something which is unique where you can actually go with a private plane to Hadumadu on the Maldives and then actually go and stay something. That's what we're trying to set up and create. Definitely as a kickoff, there will be some special offers. But I would also like to re-highlight is flexibility is key. And we've already put some measures in place where our cancellation policies will be very flexible across leisure, but also across corporate and group business based on when that business will come back in order to reassure that customers get that support that in case something does happen, there's comfort about canceling. So, so the cancellation element will get more flexibility. And yes, we will do some packages which will be then be launched once we can. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Uh, we've got a question from Michael from Neha, who's asking us about um, the, the cruise market, especially at Genting, was extremely popular among Indian travelers. So what are you going to do to get those Indian travelers back again and to build that confidence among Indian travelers? Now, when 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 the the uh, cruise is able to be back into operation, we definitely look forward to welcome uh, all our Indian guests actually on board on board the cruise ship. Now, uh, the the uh, I mentioned it's about experiential, and uh, we have been also spending a lot of time kind of like rework the way uh, how to bring the new experience into our India passenger as well. So when when the market reopened, we look for open up to welcome them back. Thank you very much, um, Saurabh. There's a really interesting question that uh, that's come in here from uh, from Harsh, who asks, "What markets do you see picking up first when it comes to outbound luxury travel from India?" I knew. So then the, the, the question then is about the destinations, right? Uh, yes. Indian outbound traveler, where, which markets would they access? Yes, in your you opinion. Know, so I think it's, uh, I can uh, take an a educated guess, but I guess this is going to be led and driven completely by the framework of the yeah. quarantine and travel restrictions, yeah. right? When India allows luxury travelers to exit, uh, the national domains and destination ABC allow Indians to come in without a 14, 14 day quarantine or any kind of, you know, uh, tough restrictions on their arrivals that allows them to experience. But if I am to take an educated guess on this, I would say if you are to study some of the hotspot outbound destinations from India, whether it's Singapore, 
Thailand as two examples, uh, which have very effectively managed to flatten and beat the curve. Uh, Thailand numbers are extremely low. Singapore numbers are uh, quite curtailed as well. So I do imagine some of these short haul markets within five hours of flying radius and Dubai may as well make it back to that sphere quite quickly, depending on how things pan out. So uh, phase one, staggered approach. Phase one, definitely Singapore, Thailand, Dubai would make a comeback, which is very heavy um, on, on Indian circuit. And as phase two, some of the progressive tourism boards that have already started to make some bold announcements. Let me call out Greece, for instance, in here, right? Um, which, which, has, which has said we'll welcome the travelers. I think they've announced the date of uh, 15th of July that we'll uh, open up the borders, post that with limited to no quarantine. They are going to be the winners. And then the stage three stack up is for destinations like Australia and New Zealand, which are a little longer haul, but we know that are in very advanced recovery stage from the pandemic. When they open their borders, Indian luxury traveler would have the opportunity to access these markets too. And Saurabh, do you think that this will, uh, and what about the business and leisure travel outbound segment? Like, so, so what so do you think that, the, the balance will be? Sure. I think uh, to, to start with, it might slightly, just to start with, the first, I would say the first 20, 25% might just be tipped in favor of business travel because the essential travel, you know, whether it's uh, United Nations, aid related, health related, essential services kicking up they might uh, kickstart some kind of travel trend. But I think the bulk of the recovery uh, in the middle 50% should be led definitely by, uh, by, by leisure travel. And to uh, uh, you know, Giovanni's and Thomas's earlier point, I fully concur that it's going to be led by the luxury leisure. This is where new trends of uh, you know, buy-offs uh, would, would, would start to come in place for small, intimate, boutique, chic hotels. And the segment that might be the very last to recover, purely because the norms are going to take that much longer to become clearer, is the meeting incentive and the group. Because, you know, that, that is a space we all need to watch out in terms of what is the future of large-scale group travel. Okay. That's a very interesting perspective, Saurabh. Thank you very much. There's a nice question that's coming from Sanjeev, who's asking, will hotel buffets be a thing of the past? I'm going to ask Giovanni that. Giovanni and Thomas are going so, to answer that. <laughs> yes. In fact, uh, it has been a, a very uh, important topic in the past few months, and people still talking about it. Um, to me, I think... Uh, will be an opportunity again to redesign and uh, re-look at, uh, at that particular area. Today, people really have learned to eat in a way that um, they are not want to share, you know, your cutlery, your food with other people. So to me, may not be the thing of the past right away, but in the short term, definitely will not be any buffet around. And what we are in particular doing here is that we are trying to minimize the a la carte menu together with the selective uh, live stations where you will go to the counter and uh, the chef and the server serve you directly without you touching anything. And this will be more the most um, popular and short term and they might be coming back in the long term the buffets but not as it used to be giovanni whatever you do please don't dismantle that beautiful dessert setup in the lobby of the fulton i'd be personally disappointed <laughs> will be done even better it will be <laughs> served and prepared in front of you I actually don't know when, when, when the buffets actually started. I think originally it was all based on an a la carte setup. And then I think we got a little bit lazy in the hospitality industry to set up these fantastic buffet styles. So I think um, having an a la carte breakfast is, is, very, is a different experience. And, and I had the pleasure just to stay in one of our properties last weekend to, to try to see how the lockdown and how the change of operation actually impacted us. And I must say, having an a la carte breakfast is a very experienced excitement and, and approach. 
than the lazy buffet going and choosing what's available. So you need to think a little bit uphand what you want to have. But actually from a hospitality service culture experience is something where you can embrace a very, very good uh, approach. And yes, I agree, buffets will be out for quite some time. Uh, we're quite fortunate that the Dubai and the UAE government have put in very strict and, and, and forward uh, rules on how to operate. Now, is the subject plastic coming back again? Because we do see a lot of things being wrapped again. You know, we all try to get away from it. But we're seeing that it's coming back again, that things and, and, and items are being wrapped up to make sure that they are prevented by, by others. But I agree, buffets, I see that they will move away for until a certain time. Thank you very much, Thomas. Uh, there's a very interesting uh, question that's coming in from Harish. Maybe Michael might want to take this and then Giovanni. What is the future of hospitality students, like training programs and placements? Are they likely to be uh, uh, jeopardized as well? Um, from our point of view... Well, sorry. Go oh, please go ahead. Go ahead, oh, please, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Okay. okay, Michael, you could start and then we could listen to Giovanni. Now, in the past, uh, the SARS and the, the business recovered. Now, the same is actually for COVID-19. It will come, it will go. The various preventive measures will, will continue to, 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 to with the business. The industry will continue to grow. We will continue to need new talent. So the industry attachment are, and are, uh, are still required. So it might not be immediate now, but in the very near future, it will still have to. Because I think the new normal will also make a lot of changes, I think, in terms of a career perspective. There will be people who are tradition industry will say, oh, I think I wanted to change and do something new. Then that also give us the opportunity to recruit a potential a candidate, and these are a good, good candidate actually for the hospitality business. Yeah. Thank you. Giovanni, how about you? What, is, what are your thoughts on this? We, we think that uh, students, it's, um, it's a very positive uh, from, and it's a very um, uh, responsible from us in, uh, in our industry to continue to support them. And in these times, it's more than ever because some of these young ones, they will witness and experience in first hand the new measures in place. And um, also to give them a chance to see how things have evolved from um, a year ago. And we are very positive in continuing to work with different uh, uh, hotel schools, association, and continue to take care of these young, awfully uh, future hoteliers that we need to grow and we need to groom them for, for the future. Okay, thank you very much, Giovanni. I'm gonna take just one last question and I'm going to probably throw it to Saurabh. Uh, Saurabh, Tanvi wants to know, how do you foresee the role of smaller independent travel agents change in the post-COVID era? Era, I beg your pardon. So th this is real a, uh, a, a question that we have been very closely analyzing. We've got close to about uh, 15 to 20 of our global sales experts that specialize in very consultative level of advisory selling on experiential travel. And the opinion that I, the profound researched opinion that I have heard so far is that the role of the smaller travel advisor who are all about curating experiences and memories is going to potentially become more important uh, especially when we are when we are paving our way back into normalcy of business technology is out there you know hotels were being commoditized and being booked like you know buying off amazon literally it was you know no human touch human contact or advisory needed but now the travelers, the, the, and this is going to be driven by a little bit of a focus from me to V, a little bit uh, departure from what's in it for me to what I leave behind. I think this kind of a transgression, this kind of evolution in the traveler frame of mind is going yes. to carve out a very, very, very distinct niche 
for these smaller independent guys, provided they are able to relay and communicate a very precise level of experience-driven information to the travel buyer. So in essence, the importance would be more than what it was before is, is, is what we believe. Okay, okay. thank you very much. Uh, we could just add to Saurabh and, yeah. and just to highlight, in our view, that audience is critical uh, because they, they have an audience which are actually the right audience we want to attract. And, and that's why we, within JA, have created the B2B tool where we're actually proactively approaching travel agents in order to make sure that they're able to book our products directly online with special codes and, and pricing segments. So we've reacted quite positively exactly onto that niche to understand that there is an opportunity exactly to fulfill and cater for those travel agents to make sure that we make them accessible, our products, than other, than other to rely on others. So, so the B2B tool will be rolled out over the next few weeks. And, and it's quite exciting for us because we've got a clear message, which we're then also supporting with regular content and exactly to promote and, and communicate to that audience. Thank you very much. Um, Michael, I'd like to take this opportunity for, to thank you for your time, for joining us. Any closing message for us? With the post-COVID will be the new norm. And then we look forward actually to welcome back all the cruisers actually from India back uh, to any of the locations that we're operating the ship soon. Yeah. Thank you very much. Giovanni, thank you so much for joining us here. Would you like to share a closing message? My closing message is um, to everyone. For every crisis, there's an opportunity. So this is the time we need to seize it and be open-minded and act on it. So it's positive, the future is bright. So it's just up to us to embrace it. Thank you very much. Uh, Thomas, I'd like to take this opportunity to thank you for your time and for your inputs. Do you have a closing message for us? Thank you, Ram, and thank you everybody else. Uh, look here. Uh, I look very positive into the future. We've had two and a half, three months based on regional locations, tough times, but uh, we've got far more time ahead of us where we can focus and enjoy ourselves with. So, so I look forward to a great future. We have a few tumbling blocks at the moment, but uh, we'll get over those. So I'm, I'm really, really looking forward. Thank you, thank you very much. And Saurabh to, you, uh, Saurabh, to you as well, thank you so much for your inputs and for your time. Thank you for being here. Do you have a closing message for us? Fantastic, Rian. Thanks to you and to my fellow, fellow panelists today. Uh, you know, the motto of Preferred Hotels and Resorts is believe in travel. Travel is a life philosophy for us. I think we have a very, very long marathon of a road to recovery. And this marathon is going to be uh, infused with a bit of a relay race uh, where a lot of us between hotels, airlines, tourism boards, cruise liners are going to be passing the baton. Uh, from one to another. So this is a rallying cry for all of us to get together, collaborate and win this marathon together. Thank you very much. And I'd like to say a special thank you to all our uh, viewers right here who've taken the time on uh, a Monday afternoon to join us. Uh, thank you very much, uh, guys, for joining us on session three of TNL Outreach. Of course, stay tuned to Travel and Leisure's uh, India's Instagram and Facebook page for all the updates and updates on our upcoming webinars. Thank you, guys, and have a wonderful evening ahead. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.